So we've got a great panel, uh, lots of good information, and um, what we'll do is we will have each of our speakers give a brief presentation, and then we will have the questions and answers at the end, uh, just to make sure we have time for all the speakers to um, have, have an opportunity to get through their presentations. And um, I, I will, um, they are recording the session, so I will repeat the question and the answer. If I, I, even if you guys can hear, we'll, uh, we'll repeat it just for the, for the recording. Um, and uh, so, so write your questions down and we'll tackle those at the end. Um, there are full biographies in your packets, and there is also a one-page overview of the m uh, project, uh, which uh, is the name of our session, m course in Florida's future. So uh, with that, I would like to invite Wei to bring it. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, I would like to invite Wei Shen to come up and talk. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, just a point of clarification: when I was working with Quiet Hours, we were about the same age. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the multimodal corridors of regional economic significance program legislation was signed into the law by the governor in May of 2019. We have some very tight deadlines, which is a challenge, but the legislation offers tremendous opportunities for the state of Florida. As Amy Baker has so eloquently talked about um, our robust population growth and the exploding tourism industry in the state of Florida, so I, I'm just going to skip this slide. Um, one takeaway for me is that by the year of 2022, we're going to have 22 million people living within the state of Florida, and that's also the deadline for BOT to start construction of the m infrastructure. So 2022, a very momentous um, year for all of us. The purpose of the M course program is to uh, well, okay, yes. is to um, protect the environment and natural resources, to encourage job creation, enhance quality of life and public safety, revitalize rural communities, and also provide regional connectivity while, while leveraging technology. I think all these purposes are very specifically outlined in the legislation. And the objective of the program is to advance construction of regional corridors that are intended to accommodate multiple modes of transportation and multiple types of infrastructure. This is so. This program is so much more than just uh, a toll road, as you can see. Along with the infrastructure improvement. M course will provide additional hurricane evacuation routes, serve to mitigate congestion, improve trade and logistics, bring broadband and sewer connectivity to our rural communities, promote energy distribution, encourage connected, shared electric vehicles and automated vehicles, enhance access to other modes of transportation, including freight and passenger rail, public transit, and enhance mobility options across the state. Um, and of course, will protect environmental resources through spring protection zones, farmland preservation, um, and to complement local plans to protect Florida's most precious natural resources. This slide shows you the three study areas. Right now, the study areas, they encompass the entire counties. The Sun Coast Corridor extending, extends from Citrus County to Jackson County with eight counties. The Northern Turnpike Corridor extending from the northern terminus of Florida's Turnpike to the Sun Coast Parkway. Um, this one has encompasses four counties. And the Southwest Central Florida Corridor extending from Collier County to Cook County um, has nine counties within its study area. The legislation calls for an inclusive consensus building task force process for each study area. FDLT will, um, some of the key deadlines are outlined on this slide. Um, we have three task forces, 
right now, one for each study area. By the end, uh, by October 1st, each task force will have to um, submit their recommendations and the report to the governor and the uh, legislature. Um, and also by December 31st, 2023, DOT will provide effective local governments with a copy of the applicable task force report and project alignments so the local governments can amend comprehensive plans. We're partnering with the uh, DOT is partnering with the Department of Economic Opportunities and also the Regional Planning Councils. It's on our radar screen that we're going to provide assistance to our uh, communities within the MCORS alignment area. We're going to be working with them to amend their comprehensive plans. So here is a, a, bit, a, a more detailed look at the inclusive consensus building process. The first stage is to explore, to document, and analyze existing and future conditions, and to identify considerations for what we should avoid, minimize, mitigate, or enhance during the process, during the end course process. The second stage is to evaluate, to um, work with the task force members to assess high level needs, identify potential guiding principles for um, avoidance, minimization, mitigation, and enhancement. At DOT, we love acronyms. So these are going to be called AMI guiding principles. And review potential corridor um, opportunity areas, path course, which is a very broad geographic area that would connect one or more um, locations. And then the final phase of the consensus building process is to work together to recommend guiding principles for the process moving forward, plus thoughts regarding which opportunities are ready to move into project development, which need more study and which should no longer be pursued because they do not support the principles. So as we say, opportunities to move into project development, we don't mean it's entirely greenfield construction. Um, we're also considering improving existing facilities, co-locating with existing facilities, interchange improvements, bypasses, that type of uh, project development. The end course legislation, because it, it takes such a broad look at all these um, interrelated issues, um, it goes beyond the traditional um, transportation goals like safety, infrastructure, um, it, it extends to and mobility, it extends to transportation decisions that can support our economy, our communities, and the environment. Um, the importance of large scale long term planning continues to, to be a regional and local, to, to be um, implemented at the regional and the local levels. I think uh, my fellow Panelist uh, Pat Steed is going to talk about the importance of long range planning opportunities. And um, the M course, the task force process, and the study areas um, offer opportunities to move forward a variety of visions and plans, priorities at the regional and community level. For example, we can support conservation plans and also um, support economic development priorities at the regional and the local level. DOT has been um, developing, planning and developing corridors for a long time. I've been working at DOT for a long time as well. I date myself. Um, the MCOR statute gives us an opportunity to move our process into the next level and fully realize the broad vision um, that's, that's provided um, to us by the legislation. For example, um, in terms of resiliency, um, instead of just simply responding to system failures, we are starting to look at how do we prepare for future risks and potential disruptors. You know, sea level rise, um, hurricane evacuation needs, all these disruptors to our infra transportation infrastructure. How do we proactively plan? and um, make sure that our infrastructure can withstand disruptions of, of natural um, and, uh, or economic um, disruptors. 
Um, in terms of the environment, in, we're not just simply avoiding impact, minimize impact, impact, and mitigate impact. We also want to look at how do we um, enhance our cultural community and the environment. Um, when we when we work to uh, improve existing facilities, we're going to focus on well, simply put, sort of uh, writing the the past wrongs. Is, is there any deficiencies with um, of these existing facilities that we don't do enough for stormwater? Um, we when we um, improve existing facilities, we're going to have a more comprehensive look at how we can enhance our natural environment as well. Um, specific considerations are outlined in the legislation for the Northern Turnpike Corridor and also the Southwest Central Florida Corridor. But we've had three task force meetings so far. The task force meeting discussions covers a much broader cover a much broader range of, of uh, resources that we need to be considering. As I mentioned um, earlier, the enforce legislation offered huge opportunities for conservation. Um, the task force may consider and recommend innovative concepts to combine right-of-way acquisition with the acquisition of lands or easements to facilitate environmental mitigation for ecosystem, wildlife habitat, or water quality protection or restoration. I think um, the legislation tells us to sort of model our process after the Wakaiba Parkway process. During the construction of the Wakaiba Parkway, um, DOT has acquired right-of-way um, when we put aside 90% of the land that we acquired for conservation purposes. So this is a huge opportunity to work together with our uh, environmental stakeholders, water management district to conserve our precious natural resources. Another key aspect of the enforced legislation is um, the workforce development. Funding has been included to combine existing and new programs for DOT to create a road and bridge construction workforce development program. The intent of this program is to uh, provide direct economic benefits to communities in which the department is constructing infrastructure projects. The law authorizes the department to administer workforce development contracts with consultants and nonprofit entities. The goals include workforce recruitment, training curriculum, support services to remove barriers to work. Here's a um, timeline graphic. It's not entirely up to scale. The task forces will um, submit their recommendations to the governor and the legislature by October of um, 2020. So far, we've had three task force meetings. The first meeting, um, the three task forces all met in, in Tampa. It was mostly organizational to get everybody organized and kind of go over what was um, specified in the legislation. Um, Secretary Hewell and Senate President Dawano was at the task force meeting, the first meeting. The second task force meeting, we talked with the task force members about the Amy guiding principles, you know, how we're going to uh, put guiding principles into the avoid, um, mini uh, minimize, mitigate, and enhance categories. And then we heard from the task force members that they kind of didn't like being PowerPointed to death. <laughs> so um, so at, Task force meeting number three, we organized a, a comprehensive panel with experts um, with expertise with uh, economic development, local visions, and the uh, environmental protection. So the interaction with with the panel members from the task force was was very positive. So um, as as the task force members here and interact with the panel members, they refine and look at uh, what guiding principles that they wanted to recommend for the department moving forward. 
So at meeting number four, we're going to talk about uh, the comprehensive plans that, that's within the study area. We assembled a panel to specifically talk about economic development and workforce issues with the task force members. Meeting number five, we will have a utility panel because it's a key point in the legislation that we need to work together with broadband, sewer, electric providers to see what opportunities are out there. And meeting number six, we will talk about emergency evac uh, evacuation and then technology. So I'm planning on two panels for meeting number six. Um, as the task force members interact with the panel members asking questions, clarify their thoughts, then they um, give staff members ideas about how we should refine the guiding principles that we have uh, a, a draft of. What we did was that we um, documented comments from the task force members and rolled them up into uh, guiding principles, but we're going to talk about these guiding principles at every meeting with the task force force members as, as we hear from these experts. So meeting number seven and eight, uh, we're pretty much going to spend some time to uh, populate the report, uh, refine, and kind of deliberate on these guiding principles. And then um, meeting number nine will be sort of spending time on the final adoption of the report and also documenting any uh, outstanding concerns from, from the various uh, task force members and, and also um, finalize on an implementation plan as to how we move forward from there. Um, public engagement opportunities are offered throughout this process. Um, at each task force meeting, we hear public comments from members of the public. We have community open houses at all the um, counties and we have a website that's up and running 24-7. Um, we even found some snail mail comments sending um, to DOT. So at each task force meeting, we're uh, going to offer statistics and let the task force members know, you know what we received in terms of public comments. So at this point, um, this concludes my presentation. I'll turn it back over to Jennifer. And I think we will uh, take questions after we all speak. Way and while well, uh, Thomas Hawkins makes his way up here from UF, I was remiss. I, I neglected to recognize our task force members, so I know I've seen at least one. Uh, Paul Owens from Wisconsin Friends of Florida. Um, thank you for your service on the task force. I know it's time consuming, a lot of meetings. Um, do we have any other task force members in the audience who would like to be recognized? Scott Coons. Scott Coons? Chris. I'm sorry? Chris Rita. Chris. Thank you very much. And two of you. Did I get everybody? Thomas. Okay. And, and Thomas. Thomas. Okay, of course. Uh, and Pat. All right. And Pat. That's right. Everybody else. Boy, we've got three of these things. Uh, all right. So Thomas is up next. Thank you. Good morning. I, I had to get up extra early in, uh, in Gainesville this morning in order to make it here for the Baker's presentation. Um, I'm glad that I did. It was, it was excellent as always. Um, my name is Thomas Hawkins, and I'm the former policy planning director at Dawson Friends of Florida, Jane West, who's our uh, current policy planning director is here. Jane, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, but um, I am a member of uh, the Southern Coast Connector Task Force, um, and I worked on the imports legislation uh, during the 2019 legislative session. Um, so I'm glad to be able to be here and talk about it. Um, my presentation kind of comes in two parts. One is I'm going to talk a little bit about MCORS and kind of give some context for a thousand friends of Florida's position on the legislation which we proposed. Um, and, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of our perspective on the process. And, and as I was putting the slides here, I kind of had this thought, well, why am, I, why am I talking about something that happened a year ago and that was resolved at a conclusion of the legislation, the legislative session when the MCORS legislation was adopted? Am I trying to relitigate something? Um, and, and I'm not. I'm, I think that talking kind of about what Thousand Friends of Florida's values are um, and how that influenced our perspective on imports is important to give context to how we're engaging in the process now um, in, in a way that's constructive but that also has a certain viewpoint. Um, I started with this slide because I had the benefit of seeing Weiwei's presentation before I put mine together. Um, and I, I really love that she used this, this center image um, in her presentation, which shows, of course, the tremendous population growth that we expect in the state of Florida. 
Um, that's an image that was uh, created by a thousand friends of Florida. We didn't actually do the lead work the Geofence Center at the University of Florida did uh, in a project that was also funded by the uh, uh, Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. And, uh, but I want to take that center image and put it next to the one on the left and the right. Um, and if these aren't clear, uh, you know, you can pull out your mobile device and Google for 2070. You can get high res uh, versions of these images. But what the reason that Thousand Friends of Florida would participate in the creation of these, and, and the reason we like to, to talk about them and share them to the public, is because we think they tell a story. The image on the left shows in red the portions of the state of Florida that were urbanized in the year 2010. And that's, that's, that's about a fifth of the state. And we projected, uh, using models the University of Florida uses to, to determine, to make a, a guesstimate as to what land will urbanize in the future, what the state would look like if we grew um, on our current trends, business as usual, following the status quo in terms of growth management policy. And the result is we get in the middle with about a third of the state urbanized. And we like to compare both of those images with the one on the right, which it accommodates the same population in 2070 as the center image, but you can see there's a lot less red. It has about a quarter of the state urbanized. In other words, a substantial increase over what we have today, um, but nowhere near as a dramatic as dramatic of an impact on a conservation land, on rural lands, and upon agricultural lands as the center image. And we think that there's policy changes that we can proactively make. And we're planners, we all believe this, that in policy we can, uh, we can change uh, what happens on the ground. But we can have a future that looks more like the right-hand image than the center image. Um, and we think that that's a better outcome for a lot of reasons. We think that if we support growth, in our urban areas, it's going to be better for the state economy. That's where our most productive workers live. And this Baker's presentation showed where are the where are the most productive workers in the state, right? Who's earning the highest wages in the state? It's the folks in Miami-Dade County, which coincidentally has the highest population density. Um, and I, I don't think that's a coincidence. You know, I, I, cities generate wealth, and we've seen a lot of data that show that. Um, uh, it's a more efficient use of existing infrastructure. It's better for those urban communities. So I believe it's also better for rural communities because we, we preserve the agricultural economies and the, the rural and ecotourism based economies that make those places unique and successful and generate their identity. <clears throat> better for ag, better for the environment. Um, and, and there's a connection between the policy decisions we make that might get us closer to the third image than the center image that relate to transportation. Uh, we, we need to invest in al transportation alternatives that don't involve the automobile. Um, the second bullet point here is in cities that means transit and, and i wanted to make a point that when you give people good transit they love it and i know this i had this i see mr castillo is nodding yesterday i was walking through uh turlington plaza on the university of florida campus how many gators know turlington plaza and there's students there they've got their they've got their tables set up and i wanted to tell melissa mccready this who's our department of mobility director she along with jesus gomez run our uh, our transit system in gainesville Students had a booth that said RTS Appreciation Day, and they were literally collecting love notes for, that students would write that they plan on distributing to RTS bus drivers. <laughs> I mean, right? When, right now that's, that's a profound statement. So I, I, of course, filled one out and asked them lots of questions. You know, why are you doing this? You guys are awesome. Will you send copies to the city commissioners, right? Um, mm -hmm. And do you have the administration? Thank uh, you. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, I think they thought I was crazy. They, they took down the email addresses, so, so we'll see. Um, uh, the last point there I want to touch on, right, which is it, it, the kind of transportation investments that are going to allow our cities to continue to urbanize and great, great places to live. We're going to focus on safety. It's a, it's a point of a little bit of personal privilege. I like to talk when I have an opportunity about transportation safety. We all know that driving is the most dangerous thing that, that we do. Um, we recently earned a new, re-earned a new accolade of the, the uh, Smart Joke America released its uh, newest Dangerous by Design report, uh, which is right here that, um, again, ranks Florida as the most dangerous place in which to ride, ride or walk a bike in the country. They do something different this year that they've never done in their report. They've always reported the fatality numbers. So drivers kill about 800 folks a year for walking or riding a bike in the state of Florida at the time that they're, they're killed. Uh, but we've got a new column here which shows injuries, um, which brings the total number of folks who are injured and killed a little bit more, about 3,500. Um, and I, I think that additional number is super important. Um, you know, death is dramatic, right? It's just somebody leaves a family behind, et cetera. 
Um, but, but injuries, they have a life impact, but you also start thinking the numbers of that when you're at what is that doing to the cost of providing health care in our emergency rooms? What is that doing to the cost of maintaining fire departments that have to respond to these emergency calls? Um, and the, the, the impact is tremendous throughout the state. Um, we previously, I, I just Googled in our local newspaper to find the most recent article on pedestrian injuries that was from last week. And there's two separate incidents, completely different parts of town where drivers struck, uh, in this instance, two people who were walking. In no way related, but we're so sort of used to this idea that this is just what happens. It didn't even warrant two articles. We, we got one, two, you know, one article for two folks. One of these is University of Florida student who, who died a few days later. But that didn't um, okay, so that's that's sort of like setting the stage of why did we have policies that led us to say that M course is the wrong kind of investment. But that's not where we are today, right? We're, we're here today talking about a planning process that the legislature did approve. It's been quite some time since, since we approved. We're probably in like the, maybe the eighth or ninth month since the conclusion of the legislative session. What, what does this process look like going forward, right? We, we, we have uh, membership on all three task forces. I represent a thousand friends of Florida on the Sun Coast. We I mentioned our president, Paul Owens, who represents a thousand friends of Florida on the Northern Con Connector. And we also have uh, one of our board members who represents a thousand friends of Florida on the, the uh, Naples to Lakeland route. What's, what's kind of our position? How are we participating in the process? And the way that I want to transition this is talking about what's in the law. Way, way did a fantastic introduction to this. Um, I want to emphasize and use some of the same language that she did because pulling it from the statute. I'm breaking all the rules of PowerPoint here. I've got We've got lots of text on the slide when we leave. So this is what the legislation says. As some of my former law students in the social group, she's she's probably having flashbacks of me me reading case law to her. Um, all right, so here's some language, right? Uh, the intended benefits of the program, and this is of course edited. We'll see lots of ellipses in here. The intended benefits of the program include broadband, freight, passenger rail protection or enhancement of wildlife corridors or environmentally sensitive areas, and protection or enhancement of primary springs protection zones and farmland preservation areas. We don't normally see that in legislation specifically focused on road construction. The, the, the purposes of the legislation include these things that are not normally what we think of as tied into the transportation project. Um, specifically regarding the Southwestern uh, Florida connector, the task force shall address impacts on the on the pro, uh, of the project uh, on panther and other critical wildland habitat, it specifically focus on panther habitat as part of this planning process. For the Sun Coast connector and uh, the bit that would, would connect the Sun Coast connector with the Turnpike and Wildwood, uh, the legislation says uh, the task forces shall evaluate design features and the need for acquisition of state conservation lands to mitigate the impact of project construction with respect to the corridors on. Water quality and quantity of springs, rivers and aquifer recharge areas, agricultural land uses, wildlife habitat. Well, how can we take this language that's that's a little bit unusual and frankly I think represents good and positive interests and and incorporate it uh, by into the planning process by supporting and working collaboratively with FDOT's process? Um, and this is kind of what what I'm thinking, and I and I know a little bit of. Um, the, the, Thousand Friends of Florida's position as well. We're looking at FDOT uh, developing information now that's going to influence their ETDM process and their PDD process. Uh, I'm not a transportation planner, so I downloaded the ETDM manual just a few months ago and I've been reading it. It's been, it's been painful. Um, <laughs> how many transportation planners can sympathize with me? Uh, okay, how about that many? It's because you all love it, right? Um, it's great. <laughs> Uh, it's job security, but <laughs> she's never read it. Did y'all hear that? <laughs> I don't believe that's true. Um, well, so what are, what are these things? What's a project description? Um, project description defines the scope of the project. It basically tells us what and where we're talking about in the transportation project. Um, the purpose and the need, the first part of that, the purpose tells us the why, what we're we trying to accomplish. Um, and the need um, is actually our data and analysis it helps explain that purpose, right? What's the gap we're trying to fill? Well, 
consistent with that statutory language that I described, why don't we have a project description that comes out of our planning process that says something like, you know, the proposed improvements include connecting civic buildings like schools, public libraries, city and county administration buildings with state-owned broadband internet infrastructure. I mean, that, that's absolutely consistent with the legislation. I think could be a, a really, this is a kind of infrastructure that it doesn't have any of those negative externalities that I, that I talked about in the beginning part of the presentation. Um, and I've advocated for this at our last task force meeting, and there were a lot of nods from the small town, city, and county commissioners that are members of the task force. Um, I haven't seen our draft guidelines that come out of that meeting yet. I'm optimistic, cautiously, to see what kind of, how, how influential it is on the process. What if we had a project description that says, you know, a proposed improvement is conserving land to create continuous swaths of public lands or water so that uh, wildlife can travel or access different habitats as part of their life cycle. I, I pulled that language right from the Florida Wildlife Corridor's explanation of its purpose. It, the statute says we want to conserve land for wildlife migration. How can we work that into the project description at its very core? Um, the proposed improvement, here's another example. The proposed improvement is connecting existing rail corridors. We're focused on freight rail. Let's Let's say that that's what the project is. It's, it's connecting the existing freight rail corridors, and let's well ride a enough wide of road right of way so that when we have uh, greater success with our currently expanding private passenger rail, we have right of way reserved so, so that's possible to expand into the future without further evident demand pursuit. Um, I would add one that, that, I, that Weiwei touched on, I think, very well. What if one of our guiding principles is not to build new corridors, but simply to improve our the roads and our existing rights of way? And I'm very glad to hear um, that, that that's simply that DOT is saying very explicitly that they're, they're focused on as part of the process. Um, likewise, with the purposes, if we define those purposes in the same vein, and in our purpose statements, uh, say things like the purpose of the project is to provide folks with uh, high speed internet connections, a purpose of the project is to do that water quality enhancement um, to protect our agricultural land uses, to protect wildlife habitat. What if our purpose that we define is uh, to allow movement of people and freight between regions of Florida by means other than automobile? Um, and, and I'm optimistic that, 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 that the task forces are on the way to at least incorporate some of these ideas. Maybe that's um, maybe that's wide-eyed, but, uh, but that's certainly the attitude that we're bringing to participation. Um, and then last, as we develop data and analysis to help uh, clearly express that need, define it in those lines as well. I don't have sample language here because it's much, I'm a lawyer, it's much easier to come up with policy language than to, than to generate data for a presentation. Um, so that's, that's everything that I wanted to touch on. I'm sorry Mayor Daly left before I could put my gator up here on the street, but if you have any questions or wants to talk, there's my contact information. Thanks. Appreciate that. And uh, uh, while our final speaker, Pat Steed, makes her way up here, uh, just a reminder we'll take questions at the end, so be uh, jotting those down, and then I will come back up here and we'll uh, have a QA session. Thank you. This is one of the few days that I don't have to do something different with the microphone, but Tom Stanley <laughs> and you have three very tall women. <laughs> um, I want to start by saying I'm taking a little bit of a different approach today, and uh, some of you know me, uh, some of you have known me for a long time, because I've known you a very long time, and some of you don't. But I've been uh, planning in the state of Florida for well over three decades, and I'll stop there. Um, so I wanted to share with you today a, a perspective, and I'm calling it a planner's perspective, and it really centers on large-scale, long-term system-based transportation plan. And uh, I'm going to start with uh, telling you a little bit about my journey as a planner and uh, some discoveries I've made along the way, some stumbling blocks I have seen and encountered, and maybe a little insight. And then I'm taking that from the perspective of the process. So um, in my journey, uh, I have really done planning on pretty much all geographies, although I haven't done any international 
I don't have a lot of international students that I work with, but um, I've really done ge the geography of planning from statewide, uh, looking at our statewide transportation system. Um, one of the projects I worked on was uh, laying out all the possible alternatives for high speed rail from Orlando to Tampa and analyzing all the impacts of 900 and something segments and coordinating the conference of plans with the local governments. And that was for the high speed rail that didn't get built. Um, I worked on three different ones that didn't get built. So uh, I've also done regional planning in my career. Uh, both in Florida and in another state. And uh, that brings with it a very interesting perspective from transportation, from all the other things that, that we really look at. I've been uh, a county planning director. I've, been, I've worked for four MPOs in my career. I've done community planning, neighborhood planning, uh, corridor planning a lot. And uh, so, and I've been a city planning director and I've worked for consultants. So I've done a whole lot of things in all those years, but all that perspective has always been looking uh, primarily from the government side of things, but also looking at it from the standpoint of each one of those areas, uniquely carrying with it uh, a whole range of things that should be looked at. And so often in planning, I've found that we look at today and the current situation, and we listen to the current people that live in the environment, come to our public meetings. And so often, we are really some of the best planning that we could do, and the broadest way that we could look at it tells us to look beyond those borders to the larger scale, and to look beyond the current time frame, and look at not only what has happened before, but what may happen afterwards, and look at some of those people that may come to be in that geography in the future. So I'm going to start a little bit with a uh, discussion on transportation and land use. And uh, I could do this as a trivia question, but probably most of you didn't know I did this one. Uh, so really, transportation started, from our perspective, uh, in the year 3500 BC. And it started when the first fixed wheels were put on a car and therefore invented our first wheel vehicles. It wasn't very long before somebody decided to be a sports car version of that, so therefore they created the chariot. And so we were off to the races. In this country, other than Native Americans, most of the people who arrived in this country and began to populate it by coming to our ports. And that's where our cities formed, or along our coastlines on either side of this country. And then people moved inland. And as they moved inland, very much the pattern they began to develop was into a rural and agrarian society where we had small farms mostly and people aligned along waterways and other things. And so a big part of our country has always been built upon those rural areas. So we are a country. I love flying on a clear day because I love to see the patterns of land and the patterns of land use. And we have transportation in our cities and the land forms that they have in each city is unique, which is one of the things I love about uh, urban development. And then we have our countryside, but likewise, it is not the same. And for those of us who are familiar with all areas of Florida, Florida is such a diverse state that we find the patchwork of that fascinating. I was talking to someone that flew up yesterday and he commented about how green and blue the state is as you fly over it. So as time went on, um, yes, things got a little bit more frantic. And uh, we began to develop transportation systems, uh, primarily these reflect our urban areas. And we began to look at different kinds of vehicles and different modes of travel. Except we tended to do that in the here and now. We tended to do that incrementally one mode at a time, and then we tried to retrofit, and then we rebuilt, and then we tried to retrofit again. We had rail systems that did or interact well with our transit systems. We have sidewalks that end in nowhere. We have bicycle lanes that are wonderful where they exist until suddenly they don't. Um, we really have so done this on such a short-term scale and, and not incorporated in a holistic way that that's one of our biggest challenges. 
And what problems does that cause? It causes us to rip up our environment and rebuild it all the time. It's disruptive to communities. It costs lots of money, and it's frequently disruptive to the environment as well. So I've always said, could we do this differently? So we have that challenge of both the urban transportation, and also we have the hazards that inevitably we have uh, that come from nature and come from man-made things, and that further complicates that. So as we look towards uh, how we marry together for our transportation is primarily uh, connected to rural areas, uh, and we look at our urban areas, then we have the phenomenon that's come upon us in the last particularly 50 years, and that's our suburban areas that surround our urban areas. And, and so how do we plan for those people that live in those areas to get to those urban amenities and job markets and other things. And, and I think one that looks like an ad sign, because then we put technology in it, we start talking about technology in the future, and we inevitably are faced with, now what? What else do we have to retrofit? What else do we need to work on? And so in that journey as a planner, and it's the journey of some of the different processes, I want to just share with you a transportation planning perspective and how we might do that differently. So this is, I don't know, that's actually supposed to be green, but uh, this is the four-step transportation model. Now, I know that a few of you actually know about the transportation model because there's a few people that are actually two true transportation modelers in this room. I know some of you and I can point some of you out and way away in this room. <laughs> we share that in common. So uh, this is a simple process, and many of you know it, and one of the things really that if you don't practice transportation planning, and that's really that we look at trip generation, and that's really how many trips uh, we're going to have produced. We look at trip distribution, and that's going to be where are those trips uh, going to go. We look at mode split, although to be perfectly honest, most of the transportation trips in Florida are satisfied on our roadways, uh, a little bit in transit, and a few core urbanized areas. Um, but it is the choice of mode. And then finally, trip assignment, and that says what path are those trips taking? Very simple process. But in our computer modeling, we do that generally based on about 20, 25 year windows. Uh, trying to say we want to get ahead of the curve. And, and you would think that 25 years would be enough to get ahead of the curve. Uh, but that's not always been the case. So once we project how many trips we're going to have in the future year, 25 years out, we then look at where they're assigned and what's going to happen to our roadway network. And that's really where we determine what's going to be over capacity, where we're going to have congestion, where we may need to widen roadways or add other things to get some more capacity. It also tells us where we may need some new roadways. And that's how generally we go about uh, using the transportation model uh, to produce uh, our long range transportation plans. Long range transportation plans are those plans that are maintained by the MPOs or transportation planning organizations. We have 27 of those in the state of Florida. Uh, so, those plans really do bring together everything from the models. Now, we do have statewide models. Urban Pike has a model. There are some specific urban models. There is the District 1 DOT model that covers all the counties in District 1. So there's lots of variations. In the state of Florida, we use a standard process called FSU-TMS, which just says we use the same standard data sets, uh, basically, to get there. But one of the things I want to point out, and this is very important when we've been talking about intercourse, intercourse is what I'm now calling the prequel to this process. It's not something that comes instead of or after. Now, some of the timing of those will occur uh, a little bit more simultaneous than normal. Funding, for instance, doesn't usually occur up front. But if you look at it, these are the steps that we generally go through as we look at a transportation project uh, going through the process. The first thing we do is get into that long range transportation plan. 
or it gets identified by the study that's not in one of those organized areas, um, then it must get in the funding queue. And projects can take 10 or 20 years, or sometimes longer, to get in that funding queue. Then they must go through uh, what we call pd and Project Development Environment Study, and go through design, preliminary engineering. The pd and &E process is the one that looks in detail at the impacts to, to communities, to businesses, to environment, and really looks at, do we have an option to build or do no build? And looks at what it would cost. So those decisions really get made at that point on individual specific projects. So once each one of these phases requires us to go back to the well to get that project funded, because it doesn't all get funded at once, unfortunately. And then we go on to many of these projects require land purchase or right for acquisition. And finally to construction. That time period, if you compress it uh, and go through typically how not considering them first, typically 10 years would be phenomenal <laughs> to get through all of that process from the time you get it in the line or 20 to get something built. Um, but frequently that has been 20 years and 30 years and sometimes segments we're still waiting on to be completed in major quarters and it doesn't get completed in a career. So with that time frame, I, I want to say, I think long-term planning, long-term system planning, is one of the best things that we could do for the future of Florida. Because short-term has kept us into this mode of continually retrofitting our systems and disrupting our communities and our transportation systems. And it has cost us dearly in money and I believe in quality of life. One of the most important things in the state of Florida that we have are the important natural systems. This is a phenomenal state, and we have unique habitats, we have wonderful natural systems, we have waters and resources critically important, we have wildlife that we must seek to maintain. One of the greatest things I think that's happened is really the work that's been done. I've worked a lot with Tom Hopkins, many of you have too, who's been one of the key people in that is really to develop that ecological greenways and to really set true priorities on um, our environmental resources. Because the truth is, we can't save it all. But if we save the key parts or we build smartly system approach, then we can ensure that we can have wildlife that can be viable, we can ensure our natural systems can continue to function, and we can have people, that is us, living in concert with that but we need to make really good decisions on infrastructure and particularly transportation. And when we can do that together, it requires us to think long-term and systems. So frequently, we need to the impact on the environment of a transportation project one increment at a time. And yes, we do cumulative impacts, but that doesn't tell us how it impacts the entire system. And so when we take that longer term and we take that bigger system approach, we're able to define where it is that we can do avoidance, where it is that we can, uh, if we have impacts, we can minimize those, we can mitigate those, or importantly, we can help in restoration of some of the things that we've already done not very well over time. But the time to do that is before you put those lines on that transportation plan. And so the sooner we do it, the longer term we do it, and the more systematic we do it, the more we'll be able to have that sustained. The second thing I've always wanted to do is to have economic development incorporate in our transportation decision making. And frequently it's not. Yes, we project where there's going to be employees and how many trips that's going to be, but it doesn't discuss the viability of the businesses that will be there or what kind of transportation system they need as well. And so with that, uh, this is just looking at one of the regions and their uh, changing industry and composition over time. These are industry clusters. And, and really, the whole state of Florida used to be very much centered around four, kind of three legged stool, we used to call it. And that was really tourism, construction, and agriculture. And in the case of um, 
instruction, just as Andy Becker said, there's a lot of it, there's less, there's more, there's less, there's more, there's less. Tourism has done nothing but grow in this really in the last hundred years in particular, and agriculture has been shrinking. So what has happened over time has been very important that Florida finds ways to diversify itself. And this is particularly true on rural areas of the state, which you also show that she shows that the areas that are in distress are almost all in our rural areas. So as we begin to look over time at the types of industry that we have, they build upon these, they diversify, we have all kinds of interesting technology coming, and other things that over time really do bring us uh, forward into changing the way we look at it. But it's important that we add this, these effects and impacts into our long-term system planning for transportation as well. That said, how has our state developed and how have our communities developed? Very similar to how the rest of the country did, it's just we're coastal, so some of our patterns are different, but, but still our, our areas have happened the same way. You know, they come to our coast, and so we have uh, development along our coastlines. People began to travel inland and, and cross, uh, and they had paths, and eventually those became kind of roads, and then they got paved, and we began to have settlements, and then we had villages, and then communities, we began to have cities, and so our form really was like any other uh, development form, it formed around our transportation system. And so we find this today, we find our commerce, we find our people, we find our investments of infrastructure, transportation, and I would say culture and heritage within these communities. And it doesn't matter if, if you're Miami or you're Tampa or if you're Wachula or if you are some other tiny place in the state of Florida, it matters that you were to have a community that is there. So having connectivity to that community when we build new corridors is essential. Having a new corridor does not necessarily disrupt those communities if they have access to it and it enhances their ability to get to jobs, to get to market, and, and to really bring those things together for that community as well. So if we have new ones, I think it's important that we have those so the patterns are there. The state has what we call the strategic interval system, which is the major transportation network across the state of Florida. Any new roads should connect to those major roads that already exist, where we've made our investment, where our, our communities are, and to what we also refer to as our regional road network uh, that are, might not be on the SIS system. And with that, we see those opportunities to look at our multimodal connectivity, and that is critical because um, this is one of my pet peeves. Right now, I'm going to I promise. Uh, I have seen us rip up the environment in Florida over and over again to put transmission lines in, to put pipelines in, to put in things that could be coordinated and put them together. I believe that looking at corners in this aspect gives us that opportunity to minimize impacts in the future by looking at bringing that together. Also, if we want passenger rail and other types of modes of transportation, and even maybe statewide regional trails where we will have a hard time placing them, this is an opportunity to include those key modes as well. So, transportation and land use uh, should be used to support economic development. That is not, uh, economic development is a good thing. All of us have a job, most of us, I believe, if we don't, we don't need more uh, in green transportation and land use with natural resource planning, we just never have fully done that, and I think we really have an opportunity in Florida to do that. But we must think long term and we must think about the system. Ensuring multi level connectivity, if we don't plan it, we'll never get it retrofitted so we can really have it working the way we'd like. And enhancing and creating the resilience of communities. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Again, when we look at this, we're looking at the various scale. But I want us to look at imports, and I want to be reading one of the paragraphs <laughs> of the law. But let me simply say, I see that as linking vision and transportation planning. 
as Red Wed talked about, one of the things that we have in the state of Florida is we have the Florida Transportation Plan. And 10 years ago, Florida did something that no other state did. They did a 50 year vision for their transportation system. So that is a plan that we have a vision. We also have policy and implementation plans that are more short term. But that is where we see that linkage with these different types of plans that look at uh, both our comprehensive plans, our regional visions, how shall we grow, Tampa Bay, Harvard 2060, um, and our community plans through our comprehensive plans as well. We look at economic plans, we look at environmental plans, we look at resiliency plans, which is really one of the keys to what we need to look at in the future. In 2005, uh, our population was 17.9 million, and the projection was that we were going to be close to 36 million by 26. Now, because we have the law, that's not the current projection, but needless to say, that was what really led a thousand friends and the University of Florida to enter into the ad work that I think was really led the way for, the, for much of the vision that we have done. And that really told us that if we were consuming land in that way, by 2060, this is what Florida would look like. And those yellow areas that were made for agriculture would be there no more. And what would happen then? Well, this was one of the alarming things that we discovered. This is what, in 2013, uh, the quarters of Florida that were determined to be heavily congested over capacity, the ones you don't want to be on. And by 2060, this is what we're looking at. From my perspective as a transportation planner, a land use planner, a everything planner, I've been all this, I've been doing this, I do not see how we solve this problem without the consideration of well-planned multi-mode corridors. I'm going to show you some, two more slides. I showed these 10 years ago, and then I had to put them away because you will understand why I had to put them away. Uh, this is looking at um, the state of Florida. Uh, this is work that was done by the University of Arizona in 2007, which set our coastline. And this is what it projected would happen at one meter of signal flux. This is what it projected would happen at three meters of signal flux. We could say that could never happen, but let's remember once upon a time all those areas were under the sea, and uh, we don't know if they will be again. I simply say that we're looking at Florida today. And we're making decisions about reinvestment of the transportation system largely concentrated around the coastal areas of Florida. Perhaps we should think about the inland possibilities as we do long-term system level planning. Thank you. Yeah. enjoyed your, uh, your prequel uh, concept. That's been uh, an ongoing discussion with us. Folks are used to seeing these types of projects maybe more at a PD&E uh, and design stage. So I like the prequel concept. Thank you for that. So um, at this time, we would like to uh, have a question and answer session for the panel. The mics are live. Uh, they're green. So if the panelists could speak into the mics, I will repeat your questions. So uh, with that, we'll get started. Melissa. Uh, my question is in the guiding principles, you talk a lot about enhancements under each of the oral principles. What do you mean by enhancements? Okay, so the question was, in the guiding principles, we talked about enhancements, and what do we mean by enhancements? So, wait, wait, would you like to take that one? I think primarily we're talking about with transportation investment that we enhance the, the built and the natural environment. So, for example, like if we purchase right-of-way, we can set aside large portions of it for conservation. Um, when we um, co-locate with existing facilities, we can we can um, improve stormwater situations. We can make sure that the the we um, enhance our facilities so that it, it can withstand sea level rise and different types of, of uh, environmental um, 
issues that we may have. Do you expect to define that anywhere in the documents? Because like the purposes that the purpose statements that were laid out by Thomas are exactly what you're talking about. So is that going to be defined in here? Yes, um, we're working with the task force members on developing these guiding principles. It will be clearly laid out. Um, you know, the, the four categories for these guiding principles are avoid, minimize, mitigate, and enhance. So enhancement is sort of a, a concept that we're um, spending a lot of time on because, you know, we've, we've done transportation planning with the other three, but enhancement is a great opportunity that we need to um, take advantage of. And then, well, since you talked about the guiding principles, I didn't talk about it in my presentation. Some people ask, you know, how, how, how do you carry these things forward? As an agency, we make commitments to our partners and to the task force members that, you know, the guiding principles developed by the task force will be carried forward into the planning, the PD&E, design, construction throughout the process. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, Pat talked about natural system protection and resiliency a little bit. Tom talked a little bit about uh, the uh, Thousand Parts of Florida land use study and uh, also talked about protection of corridors for future rail and right of way. How is the MCORS process trying to deal with resiliency, the need for resiliency of the natural system, uh, given climate change will affect habitats, corridors on a 50 to 100 year time frame? How are you getting a scientific input to look at that, not just existing, trying to deal with existing systems, but how that's going to change in 50 to 100 years. So uh, just to repeat the, the question uh, was, how is the, will the MCORS process deal with uh, resiliency, including natural systems? And particularly focused on natural systems, since habitats and corridors are almost undoubtedly going to change to some degree. I mean, just think of camping. We're already seeing that, that movement, because that's going to happen with others. And, and the things that can't move, like veget like the, uh, critical listed plant species, things like that, and, and communities, they're going to move as the climate changes also. And how are you not cutting off the ability to try to ensure type of protection of that? I know it's a very complicated, very different, I'm a scientist myself, so you know, and I used to work for Nature Conservancy, and I worked for South Florida Water Management District, and I worked for DCA, so I've had like, you know, some land use, and, but uh, how is that even being approached by them for then you run the risk of not having resilient natural systems and having uh, created away things today that are hurt you tomorrow. I can answer that. Nobody's going to try to answer that. Why don't you take a stab at it? Okay, so just about your controversial issue. Yeah, about my, my answer, I don't, I don't think it would be very satisfying to you at all. I mean, that's that I, I, don't, I don't expect the process to do that. I, my, I started my involvement in this process thinking that the best thing to do would be to generate lots of data because I think of the underlying assumptions in the bill that the best thing we can do for economic development in the state of Florida is build a bunch of toll roads everywhere. And I don't think that's a sound concept. Um, uh, so, I, so my thinking was let's generate a lot of data, let's figure out how much it'll cost to build these things. You know, and, then, and then we'll be able to think more logically and say, well, hey, what if we took that $100 billion and put Put it into Miami Dade's metro rail system. We put the light rail system in the Bay. Right? We, we can sort of, sort of think more about what our options are with that money. Or I, I very quickly realized that that thinking was was spurious. It wasn't helpful. Right? Yeah, and I guess the so, follow-up follow to that is that if you don't have that resiliency built into your long-range planning effort here, and environmentalists oppose this, is it just going to go? You know, get Go forward anyway, regardless of that you know, legitimate opposition. Well, as and an realize there's a lot of politics and everything else. Yeah, as an agency, well, from the I know you're talking about the natural system, the resiliency of the natural system. As an agency, we started a working group. Um, we beefed up our efforts on um, our infrastructure resiliency efforts. The, like Pat said earlier. We're at the pre-call process for the task forces. So what our mode of operation in dealing with these issues, long-term issues, the evolving 
um, natural system is that we work with our task force members, we work with our resource agencies, our federal, local, regional partners, and we work with um, experts like Tom Hofter from the universities. Um, it, it's all in the assumptions. <clears throat> 50 years, 100 years into the future, you saw Pat's uh, presentation, uh, a quarter of our state could be underwater. So how, how do you accommodate um, that type of consideration? So what we committed to is to work with our local and regional partners and state water partners and work with credible scientific experts to uh, accommodate these considerations. But I just don't have, at the task force level, we're still at a, a high level talk about guiding principles. Um, I mean, I felt, you know, I was on over 50 different task force work groups, including the staff and like the Governor's Commission of State of South Florida, the big six year effort on the Everglades restoration. So I'm aware of some of the long range stuff, but if you're going to plan nature out, why aren't you planning for how the other parts of that system, like the natural system, are going to change in that time frame also. Whether, you know, you've got legitimate projections of, you know, three feet to four feet by 2100, but it's more than, climate change is more than just sea level rise. Climate change is a lot of other factors that will move habitats. I mean, bird migration in the United States, for instance, is moving this way, you know, as climate change has been happening. But that's, that's been studied why aren't you looking for some of that, I guess, if you're going to do this major infrastructure that's going to have impacts on the environment, particularly corridors and habitats? First of all, we are not not looking at it. We are looking at these issues. And um, we're, the task force process, the purpose of it is to have the broader vision rather than just focus on, do we need to build a road here? You know, we're talking about need, how we preserve and protect and enhance our natural environment. But, you know, some of these looking into the future 100 years, it, it, it takes time. And then as we progress through the process, we're going to take these into consideration. So it, it's all in your assumptions. Thank you, Weiwei. I think we've got some other uh, questions. Yes, why? Um, so this is kind of maybe flipping Henry's question, and it's, it's really for Pat. Uh, I saw some data, um, something maybe late over the weekend or early this week, regarding sea level rise and if it goes up six feet, um, what are the areas of the country um, where population is most vulnerable? And of course, in case of Florida, that's the coast. Um, but the heartland showed as an opportunity for where people might relocate to. And so what are the economic considerations and population considerations regarding the heartland area and how that relates to your core? That's a really good question. Two years ago, when we first did heartland 26 feet addition process, and as part of that, while we're doing a lot of the environmental and economic and other work to look at seven counties only, we looked at uh, population displacement from coastal areas inland to see how much impact we thought it would have. And when we looked at it, the numbers within that time frame, which was the few years at that time, was not dramatic enough to change major land use allocations or to have too much impact. But in that time frame, we're updating the vision now. In that time frame to now, we are talking about far greater projections for sea level rise. So one of the things that we talked about is uh, going in and redoing that uh, to see if how much more displacement we would see. Because we see the same thing uh, as that potential. And we have, as strange as it is, we get people that, that are moving in on it. And some of them say, we know we're going to have to do it at some point, so this is a good time to do it before housing prices go up or mortgage prices go up. Well, but people actually say that. So it's obvious that, that there is a mindset that that will likely be one of the things. There's so many other things that may happen that may affect climate change as well as we know, just the general effect on our agricultural lands and what crops can be uh, you know, done productively uh, within them is ever changing. I mean, it's rapidly changing right now in the state of Florida. So some of these things, I think we cannot know the answers to those. But I do think that that we can plan for opportunities to address them within our corridors. We may not even know where they're going to be exactly until we do the more detailed thing, which may 
had come out of decade and one since then. But when we do those things, I think it's always looking forward. It's always considering that the state may be very different, both in its population distribution and in its land use pattern. Thank you, Pat. Uh, Whit, do you have a question? Sure. Um, I think Enforce is a, um, a departure from how we've done the statewide transportation planning. So I think there's something to be said for that. But I guess my question would be, uh, we seem to be stuck in our funding mechanisms for transportation uh, since about 1989 or even earlier in terms of how we fund transit, how we fund roadways. So I think there's a lot of skepticism uh, in the Enforce program because it just seems like a perpetuation of how we've always done things. And we're really struggling in the urban areas to have funding flexibility for things like the strategic intermodal system, uh, which can't fund transit really to speak of. Um, is there any thought about, uh, as you go forward, looking at things like the declining nature of the gas tax revenues, which 2025, 20, I think, is the year now when that will start to decline, uh, and, and other mechanisms that would give more flexibility to the urban areas, or even to these import corridors, like value capture and things like that to fund more transportation investments. I think if we're going to be thinking about the corridors, it's important to also think about how we fund transportation. Um, and I'll, I'll just paraphrase briefly. Uh, and so, if uh, panelists can think about, um, is, is is there a way through this process that we may be able to look at additional flexibility in funding mechanisms such as um, uh, transit um, and uh, how we may address declining gas tax revenues? So, if anybody wants to tackle that, maybe. Okay. Um, since we're talking about our connections to each other, uh, Witt was the first person I interviewed with when I um, got out my um, master's degree. So um, I'm glad you brought this question up because um, in terms of um, MCOS being a departure from um, what we normally do, um, transportation planning, I think you're right because um, the, the, the purpose and need of MCOS is not entirely traffic-based. There are these other broad goals that the legislation wants DOT to address. But what I want to assure our stakeholders and everybody here is that we're not skipping any steps. We have very tight deadlines, but all the step DOT process, we're still gonna follow the DOT process for the ETDM, the environmental screening, the financial feasibility. So you talked about the funding. Um, I think for meeting number four, we have a brief presentation about the funding framework, um, the, the sources of funding that could be available to the mTOR projects. But um, if it does not, if a project does not pass financial feasibility, it's not going to be built. So we're not skipping any of these steps. And then, with I'm glad you also talked about uh, the strategic intermodal system. Secretary Tebow has challenged us to think about new ways that we can enhance mobility. Um, one of the key things that we're discussing internally is uh, what do we need to do to um, make sure that the strategic intermodal system would serve us better to move people and freight. So that's a, the, um, the CIS policy plan is going to be updated in 2021. We're teeing up some ideas about what can we do transit, um, can we fund TSMNO projects? Can we fund um, operational improvements? What does, you know, do we need to change the concept of what is capacity improvement that's slated for CIS funding? So um, it's a key topic that we're discussing right now. Okay, thank you, Wei Wei. Uh, Trisha, yes. Yeah, um, my question about, you're, you're talking about a huge, massive change to regional facilities. But of course, that's going to mean massive changes at local levels, because all politics, even at a national level, are still local. And all roadways, even regional roadways, are local. So what are you going to do? We talked about how development patterns may be changing due to climate change, all of those kinds of things. How can this program be used to build capacity at the local level to address the, the kinds of transportation changes that are occurring now. We're seeing transportation changes in the last three years that, that are once in a lifetime kind of changes. So how can this system be used to 
help build capacity in smaller jurisdictions that are really kind of getting blindsided by the, the scope of the changes we're seeing. <laughs> okay, so I'll try to paraphrase. The uh, question is, um, how can this uh, Enforce program help address capacity at the local level to address some of the changes that the panelists discussed, um, including at the smaller jurisdictions? <laughs> Patricia? Um, <laughs> Another modeler. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, I think from the department's perspective, um, in terms of the task force process, we are working very closely with our local and regional partners to make sure that we uh, support their vision. Like if a downtown area, historical area, they don't want a highway going through their downtown area, we're going to we're not going to go through there. If they want to bypass, we're going to be working with them. So it, it's coordination. And then um, right now in the task force process, we need to formulate these thoughts into guiding principles so that would bind us in our decision making as we move forward. Pat, do you have, I think you have insights. And I think what Wayne was in transportation, you know, if we went back to the cities that were formed, the suburbs that happened, commerce went from downtowns to those suburban malls and those centers and built the big boxes. Now we have to divest ourselves so we get all of these big boxes. We're putting specialty and entertainment and other things with our employment base back in downtowns. Not a whole lot of commercial because that's being delivered to our door every day by the 25 people that will come on my call this afternoon and deliver the goods and packages, I believe. So, so that's a whole new transportation challenge. That happened so rapidly. We as planners were not prepared either for land use or transportation or you know, commerce adaptability. Uh, Macy's announced this morning 125 stores are being closed, blah, blah, blah. We're, it's just we're in this new thing. The question is, where are we going to be in 20 years? And where are we going to be in 50 years? And I think the challenge is we don't know. But I almost think that resiliency and adaptability are the most key things that we can do, which says that we have to dialogue, we have to be flexible. As Whit was saying, we have to look at new ways to, to address things, we have to look at new ways to plan things. If course is a process that's prescriptive in the fact that in our legislation, but it gives us an opportunity for the dialogue that I think can help make us more resilient because we need a lot of resiliency planning. Of course, since you're the vice chair of the well, steering committee. <laughs> but it's important because uh, statewide, the, the Florida Transportation Plan is done every five years. But one of the important things this time out, we said, oh, there's a lot of new things to address. And the first thing we did was establish an ACE subcommittee, and that's autonomous connected electric and shared vehicles for those of you that don't speak ACEs. But that very concept of doing that, uh, we, we put maybe 10 of the, the, the steering committee members, of which we have about 45, about 10 of them, eight or 10 of them said, well, we'll be on ACES. And then he said, but we can have friends at ACES, like any of you that want to engage. Yesterday, we had a meeting. There were 50 people on the go to meeting call, and there were 20 or more people in the room. And, and, and we've added additional meetings. It has really grown. We've toyed ideas and lots of the things that we're talking about because things are changing rapidly and we don't have a system that can accommodate those things and it won't happen. They won't, they won't be that they won't work. The other thing is that a uh, committee, a uh, subcommittee has been formed on resiliency. And that committee has got good thought leaders, some of you may be on it. And that, those things are going to help inform the broader state plan so we can bring that into these other pieces that we're doing, even such as NCORs over time. Because NCORs are wrong, it's not going to take care of this platform, but by doing it from the top and bringing it all the way down, ultimately a long race plans, comprehensive plans, and others, I think this, we're, we're on a good track right now. We seem to quite get to this whole floor, so I'm very excited about that. Okay, other questions? Uh, corridors and maintenance to uh, 
Jefferson County um, is going to address Florida's transportation needs and economic needs in that corridor. But the better question has been to have legislation that says how do we best address these needs in this corridor. And the second part of it is an unrealistic timeline. As Pat noted, I think it takes about 10 years just to do the planning process. And this is a 300 plus mile road. So my question is, uh, given the timeline, Uh, so I'll paraphrase that. Um, the question was, uh, given the tight timeline of the MCORS process, um, after the task force submits their report to the governor's office and the legislature, uh, will there be an opportunity then to step back and refine how best to address transportation and economic needs in Florida? In, in the courts, excuse me. Vivian, thank you for the question. I think um, the tight timeline is a challenge but it's not insurmountable. What we're trying to do is to not skip any steps, but also just overlap some of the steps. So during the task, we've been transparent with the task force members that, uh, you know, we're now starting the alternative corridors analysis, pulling all the data together that we can um, support the task force in their deliberations. And then as we move forward, like I said before, we're not skipping any of the ETDM to project um, development and environment processes. So the traffic analysis is going to be performed for any of the segments that we're going to be proposing going, going forward. So um, whether there's the traffic that, that supports the, 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 belt, the, the going forward or not, and then we're also going to do environmental and um, financial feasibility analysis to see whether it's environmentally feasible or it's um, financially feasible. If, if a project does not pass these tests, it doesn't get moved forward. And I, I understand you're saying, you know, normally when we do, when we take a look at the need, it's more from a transportation, a traffic perspective, but the legislation has a much broader um, scope for DOT, so we're we're learning to kind of broad, broaden our horizon to look at these other benefits that our transportation investments can bring to the state of Florida. Uh, Thomas or Pat, would you like to ask something? Okay, other questions. Uh, why? Oh, sorry. I think I'm not going to Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I think a lot of us seem to. Are starting to uh, reevaluate our view on large public infrastructure investment and what it means to us as planners and our, our communities in the long term. Uh, in 2016, ASC did their four year evaluation of the uh, infrastructure here in the state of Florida. It was mostly cities and beats. And we got like a B on ports and a B on airport, uh, on airports. Uh, but everything else, you know, if your kid brought home a report card with C's and D's on it and asked to participate in some extracurricular activities, you'd probably say no. I mean, I mean, that's that. I think most of us would be that way. So here we are talking about some fairly significant public infrastructure improvements, and I know it's under the guise of long-term planning, but the reality is the DOT is leading the charge. All the projects are referred to, things like the Turnpike Extension, and the Suncoast Parkway Extension. Um, how do we get caught up? And we're going to get another grade from ASCE in 2020. But how do we get caught up on a, what's clearly a deficit in our in our public infrastructure, while at the same time making these significant uh, improvements uh, or significant investments in, in, in what are going to be some very very large public infrastructure? Okay, so I'll paraphrase. But I think the the question. Um, basically is uh, how do we get caught up on our infrastructure deficit where we are receiving grades of C's and D's for the existing infrastructure while uh, uh, looking at additional improvements and investments in large projects? 
um, if a child brings home a report card with the C and Bs, don't you want that child to improve, you know, to, to bring the grades up? So um, two points, of M course pro program funding is not gonna take away um, from funding for any other projects. There's, there was um, some concern about M course taking up all the investments. Um, Financial feasibility analysis is going to be done on M core segments. If it doesn't pass, it's not going to move forward. It's not going to take away the investment that that's planned for um, for the other improvements that we're going to have. And then, um, well, I kind of forgot my second point. Well, the second point was uh, bringing, um, you know, improving existing facility is, is a priority. So. Um, during this process, it's a great opportunity for us to take a look at the existing facilities within all the study areas to see what we can improve. Okay, thanks. Thanks. I, um, I have a couple of thoughts in response to your question. And one is that I, I agree with your premise, but I think that's one of the premises. I 100% agree with your premise. I think it reflects a value statement by the legislature. And there, the, the value that the legislature expressed in adopting the bill is different than the value statement that, that you're describing. Um, and uh, for what it's what it's worth, I, I think FTOT is doing a really good job responding. Um, I, I, you know, sort of I described earlier that I was you know, I had ideas of what I was thinking how the planning process that like how the national planning process has worked, but. I think with the assistance of open communication from FDOT, see a collaborative way of working process. Um, and that doesn't mean I don't care what I want out of it or that thousand friends get more points out of it, uh, but that FDOT is doing a good job of planning. Um, the specific, I want to comment on the specific funding for a second. The bill provides for the Turnpike Authority to issue bonds to pay for exports. They do have to meet the financial feasibility standard. Um, I can't remember the exact numbers, but if anybody's familiar with the statute, you know, you can have a road that pencils out to lose a whole lot of money and still pass the financial feasibility standard. You don't have to pay the full debt service to other bonds for decades, and you can still be measured as financially feasible. Um, and that's if it meets its projections, which is obviously right not not necessity. We have we have projects that have been funded by turnpike bonds and haven't met their their uh, user projections. Um, so. I think that's an issue. If I commuted in Miami Dade County and I paid tolls to get to work every day, I would be upset about it, of course, right? Because I would, I would know there's upward pressure on my toll rates for something that's not going to change my commute pattern. Um, I, 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 mean, I, I want to take a diversion for a second and respond to a comment that uh, the question that Wyatt asked earlier about uh, migration patterns uh, due to sea level rise um, and do a plug for uh, an upcoming report that. And I don't think it's being authored yet, but that the Vivian Young from the Thousand of Friends of Florida is working on diligently to get funding secured for it. That's sea level rise 2070. It'll update our existing Florida 2070 report um, with uh, projections on migration and other changes in sea level rise. Uh, Thomas, I just, if I could, one clarification as the perfect person in the room. <laughs> um, the easiest way for me to explain the bonds is they're, they're essentially a mortgage that has to be paid off in 30 years. So uh, that's the short answer. We can geek out on that. But uh, I think why it's already signaling me there to wrap it up. And Pat, I'm sorry, did you have comments on that one before we jump to why? Were you um, okay on time? Okay, one minute. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I was just going to say, because we do a follow up to this, and people say, well, you know, we've never done anything like this. Well, we want to do exactly like this. But back in I can't remember the year it was, I guess it was the new one. Uh, but uh, the legislature suddenly discovered that the turnpike had paid off the bonds for all the paper system and said, could we expand our transportation network to stay in Florida with other tall roads? And all of a sudden, out of that legislative session, seven projects were pushed forward. And again, six of them uh, became feasible and got built. I could name probably. Four of the six off the top of my head, but I would guarantee you if you live in any of those areas today, and you were to think about what it would be like to try to get around in your area, those roadways weren't there, you would go, Oh, well, that's me. I agree. There's at least one significant other corner that I know about, and there's one that didn't get built because it turned out not to meet that feasibility level. This is not the first time we, the legislature, 
pushed us to look at this, and that finance the fifth house would be financially feasible to pursue. Why does have good time for that? Okay. Five to eleven years ago, there were opportunities for federal infrastructure dollars that the state legislature turned down. Do we expect any of those kind of opportunities in the future? And what do we think the legislature would do? I know they turned it down because they didn't like some of the ties to the home. So to paraphrase that question, there uh, there was previous uh, efforts or previous opportunities for federal infrastructure dollars that were uh, turned down. Um, do we anticipate those opportunities may be available again and what might the response be? We're working very closely with our federal and regional local partners and uh, I can't speculate on <laughs> what the legislature is going to do. Okay, why? One more? Okay, Chuck, or me, you had your hand up. Um, just one question in terms of whether or not the import program will also have funding mechanisms for the connections to these new corridors. You know, that's going to put additional pressures on the local individuals and county commissions to prioritize connections to the new corridor that there may be some other long standing legacy ones that may be built for the new corridor. So that question was uh, would the Enforce program have funding for connections to the corridors that are being looked at? Connectivity to move people and freight is a key consideration, but uh, we haven't gotten the MCOR's funding uh, totally worked out because we know what we can do. There are different sources, and um, we'll, we'll support the local visions, but at this point, we don't have any alignments. And so the funding question is, is a bit premature to discuss because, you know, when, when you have a connection from a local facility to the MCOR's facility, there are different types of funding that would be available for that, and it also depends on the counties. Um, priority process and also if it's within an NPO area, it depends on what's in the LRTP, but the department is committed to working with our partners to make sure our system is interconnected. And Chuck, some of that may occur more uh, further down the line with the interchange discussion, I would think. Is that fair? Maybe? Yeah, okay. yeah. We're also working on some mm -hmm. interchange uh, management plan planning um, guidance to assist our local partners in kind of thinking about, you know, if you get in the interchange, what do you want to do around it? If you don't want sprawl, if you want a more condensed development, what, what are some of the best practices that you can uh, support? Well, thank you all for all the great questions. Let's thank our three panelists.